How you doing, sir? Terrible. Thanks for asking. Okay, folks, we just come down a slope on that car 1,350 feet, almost a quarter of a mile. Now, we're sitting straight down beneath the surface, this point here, about 250 feet. Some areas, 300 feet as we pass through. We ended up here in what's called a clerk bed. This here was once made of coal cleared out. What are you doing down there? <laughs> These large openings you see here are called gangways. We have three more gangways above us three more gangways below us. A total of seven here in the Lackawanna Coal Basin, only they're pitched off at angles, not directly on top of each other. Red line in the case of water line. I'm sure you heard water coming down the slope. You'll see water laying throughout. That water works its way down to the slower gangway, which is completely flooded. Years ago, they would have to use some type, some type of a steam pump to continuously pump the water out. But in 1966, the state came in. There's a river about seven miles down. They placed the borehole leading into this gangway. That water now flows yeah. right into that river. This area here goes in a northward, northward direction for about 33 miles. This goes in an easterly direction for about seven miles. So this one mine has a total of about 40 miles of these gangways attached to it. At one time, you can walk underground here 33 miles in one direction, seven miles in another direction. Black tells you where your coal is, gray is your roof and your floors. Again, we came down the slope. We're located right about here. We're going to take a stroll down this gangway. We'll see chambers as we walk through. We get here from the slope, also about a quarter mile down. There's a large exhaust fan powered by electric to the areas that go by steam. Further back, we'll come in closer contact with the fan back in that area, giving us some breathing air. Black squares represent coal pillars. 
left in and necessary to support the roofs and the floors. Now these pillars also had to be in a straight line down to support. They couldn't be staggered in any way. That could cause a roof collapse or what's called a subsidence. So every 30 days, an engineer or surveyors would work their way through, map out the progress of the mine. At that time, board down if necessary, making sure they were in a straight line down. It's called columnizing the pillars. Okay, uh, but uh, for those of you not, not familiar with coal, this is anthracite coal. This here is the hard coal country. Don't confuse it with the soft coal or bituminous coal they're mining today for the power plants. That's found in western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Utah, Wyoming, and through those areas. Circle the hard coal region, this is the anthracite region. These props placed in by the miners as they work their way through, you'll see them throughout the gangways, throughout the chambers. Now, if you notice, they're only wedged in. There's no pressure on them whatsoever. If this roof starts to settle down, it would put pressure on these props, causing them to crack, pop, make noise, eventually break in half. That was a miner's warning for the alarm system. Bad moves out of here in a hurry, that roof was giving way. That's the only purpose they serve. They can support absolutely nothing. It's all solid sandstone above your head, which is approximately 60 foot thick in this area. There's millions and tons of sandstone. But at times that roof came down without any warning, many miners were crushed to death, or in certain instances, their air supply cut off, they suffocated to death. Okay, short distance down, you see that fenced in area, that's a chamber leading to the gangway below us. It goes down 250 feet to the gangway below us. If you look up to your right, it goes up 250 feet to the gangway above us. So if you want to take a walk by there so everybody gets a look down, I'll wait for a short distance up, but you can start down here. There's three more gangways below us, which look like this gangway here. They would start at that bottom but gangway, work their way up. Naturally, it's easier to push full down than to carry it up, as you can see right there. But what you're looking down there once was a solid vein of coal. Once they cleared that coal out, as you can see, it continues on up in this direction here. Now, this goes up around 250 feet around the length of a football field to the gangway above us. They would have a wooden chute. Place that coal in the chute, force it down to the car which was sitting here on the tracks. Now as I pointed out on the board, it's black squares. If you can see where my light is shining, that there is a solid pillar of anthracite coal left in and necessary to support the roofs and the floors. There's three more directly above it, three more directly below it. The further down they went, the larger they had to be because of depth and pressure. Okay,
was a working coal mine from 1860 through 1966. This mine closed in 1966, as did all the other mines in the Scranton area. There are no more working mines in this area. Just right now, very little demand for this type of coal, this anthracite coal, probably is the biggest reason. Now remember when it was a working mine, they had no lights strung out, it was pitch dark down here. You couldn't see your hands in front of you. No boards between the rails which you're walking on, no red ash leveling it off. Very dark, very dangerous. This contraption you see here called a jalopy or an electric mule. Now if you notice, it runs a little like a trolley car. You can see that arm extended up in the front. As we're walking through the gangways, you'll see pipes sticking down from the roof along the sides. They once supported the thick bare copper wire, which also ran to the surface, where they would power this here electric mule. The light you see shining behind me in that pit, nothing more than a mechanic's pit, where they worked on these cars underground year round. Rather than fight the elements on the surface, very cold winters and hot summers, temperature stays the same throughout the years. You feel it right now, it very rarely ever changes between 48 and 50 degrees, so they work right underground. Not only uh, was it pitch dark underground, uh, they also had it contained with gases. Two most common types of gas found in these mines, a methane gas, which we build up in their coal here in pockets. Near the floor, another type of gas, carbon dioxide gas, mine is called a black damp. That was a very nauseous gas, can make you very sick, containing very little oxygen or air. If you couldn't lay on that plane length of time, chances are you would suffocate. At the 1800s, the, age, the way they were checked with these gases, they look up on this prop, you see a little cage. They use canaries because they breathe about 200 times faster than the human. The gas might affect them before it was human. And in the late 1800s, in around 1899, in Wales, somebody invented what's called a daily safety lantern. A sealed lantern, a little flame in the bottom, this would not cause an explosion. They then replaced the canaries with a man called a fire boss. His job to come down about three in the morning with his lantern, checking for any gas or any roof collapse. As he worked his way through, if he held his lantern in the coal where that methane gas had a tendency to escape, <coughs> he would see that small flame start to rise until it reached the top of the lantern. That told him there was methane gas in the area. If he held his lantern down near the floor where they had carbon dioxide or black damp, not enough oxygen to support that flame, that flame would go out. Now when they came to an area like this, you can see this here is all a solid wall of anthracite coal. Rather than using a pick and a bar trying to chip away at that, the miner would tell his labor to start boring holes using <coughs> this type of a drill bit. He would place this in, place this either on his waist or on his shoulder and start boring the hole about six to eight foot in. Now they worked the section at a time, placing maybe 10 boreholes. Now once the boreholes were in place, the miner would get his black powder or his dynamite, say dynamite in this case, pack it into these boreholes, attach a blasting cap to the dynamite. He had a large roll of wire, which he would attach one end of the wire under the blasting cap. Roll this off to a safe distance to maybe where we exited the car so they didn't get hit by a flying piece of coal and a lot of dust. In that area, they had a box, which looks like this box here, the detonator box. They would pass the other end of the wire under the box. Now once in that safe area, the miner would then have to haul it three times to clear the area of any of the workers by hauling fire, 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 and hold. Wait about 30, 40 seconds, make sure it was clear, once it was clear, when you give me a hand, you know how this works. You can watch Wiley Perry and right yeah. now. Yeah. It's easy though. You're going to push too hard, you're going to set the dynamite up. So <laughs> <laughs> ready? Push. That would 
set up the dynamite loose enough to cool, leaving large cracks. They would come back in about a half an hour with their picks and their bars, praying that loose coal out, placing it into a conveyor belt. As you can see, they did have power here in the 1930s. Further back towards the end, we'll see a wooden chute sticking down where they would have to force the coal down with their feet, hands, or shovels. Anybody could to load the cars. protection laws protecting children from working underground. Children started working underground here at the age of 10 years old. They continued to work their way up until they became miners, provided they lived that long, many disasters in these mines, many of these children lost their lives. In 1900, 20% of the workforce underground were children 16 years of age. Here you can see a 15-year-old boy called a mule boy or the mule driver. He was paid 13 cents an hour. They worked 12 hours a day, five sometimes six days a week. They started their shift six in the morning. They came underground when it was dark. They went up at six o'clock at night, it was dark. No daylight saving time back in those days. So the only time these young fellows seen daylight, if they were lucky, maybe up on the weekend. Now his job was to lead a mule, four mules through here, sometimes working up to a team of six mules, depending on the number of cars he had. He was only equipped with a carbide lamp on his hat. Not a light bulb. He had a little exposed flame, probably equivalent to a birthday candle. That's all the light they had to see with. Very deceiving with all these flood lamps lighting it up, but remember it was pitch dark, only a little flame burning. In his hand, you see as I have here, is what's called a sprite stick. These cars had no brakes. He would have to slow or stop this car in a certain area, naturally so he didn't run over the mule. By getting that sprite stick, Jamming it into the spokes of the wheel, or maybe between the track and the wheel to slow it down, using a couple more to completely stop it. But as I said, pitch dark, only a little flame burning. Sometimes he slipped, went in too far. That car ran over his fingers or his hands, severed his fingers or his hands off. Many of these boys died from infections, as they had no antibiotic or treatment back in those days. Mills never left the mine. He lived their entire life underground, usually stable close to an entrance. Easy access to bring food down. Okay, guys, you get in there. Put your helmet, I said. Put your helmet so they can Come on, everybody, look at the camera and do this quick. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, so kids, are you so let's give them a raise and give them a quarter now. They only get like a quarter. No, they don't. Okay, this uh, little shanty you see here was uh, usually called a pegboard shanty. As you can see, the pegboard fastened on the wall with the miner's names listed. Uh, you can see pegs alongside their name. That's the way they kept track of the miners when they went further into work. Also, Thames called the fire boss shanty, passing by your stand. Explained his job a little earlier. He would come down about three in the morning with his lantern, checking for any gas or any roof flaps. 
Usually he would work his way back to the shanty about six in the morning when the miners were lined up waiting for their job assignments. He would assign them their jobs, they would then begin to peg in. At the end of the shift, the section foreman, his relief man because the fire boss started earlier, he would check that board. If he found any pegs still left in, he would have to go back and find them. Maybe they were overcome by gas, possibly an explosion or a cave-in, make arrangements to bring them out whether they were dead or alive. Possibly on their backs. You can see the miner there on the left side, sort of crouched down on his back. <laughs> Over here on the far right side, you can see him sliding around on his stomach. Absolutely no room to stand up. But what you're looking at here, once was a solid vein of coal mine not many years ago. Again, it extends up about 250 feet to the gangway above us. Still, they placed their props in as a warning if that roof started to settle down. Now you can see the miner here on the right side, pulling up another extension for what's called a shaker chute. Again, this here is powered by electric. As they place the coal in, this would shake or vibrate, working that coal down in a car which was sitting around the tracks. Now in the 1800s, early 1900s, these miners would have to wrap rags around their knees to help protect their knees from being all cut and blistered. It wasn't until much later in the 1900s, somebody came up with the idea for knee pads. They would then strap these onto their knees to protect them. here is what they call, call an airlock chamber. Now they had to control the airflow in certain gangways where they had their exhaust fans. You can hear the noise on the other side of the door, nothing more than the exhaust fan which is sitting up there on the surface. But if this gangway were left open, that exhaust fan would pull the air through here, possibly pulling some methane gas or explosive gases into other chambers. So they had to control that airflow. Usually they placed heavy barnwood type doors across the gangways placed a young fellow in here called a nipper boy. His age, 10 years old, paid 11 cents an hour. Sat down in the dark, 12 hours a day, five, sometimes six days a week. His only, his only job, listening to the cars rumbling down the tracks. As he heard them quickly get up, open those heavy wooden doors, let the cars pass through, then close the doors again. He 
was not equipped with a coal oil lamp, same as a carbide lamp, that emitted a flame equivalent to a birthday candle. Although most of these boys, they couldn't read or write because they quit school very early and left to start working with these mines. Not underground here, but on the surface, about a mile away, they had what you call coal breakers. They started there as breaker boys at the age of seven years old, worked their way underground at the age of 10. Seven? On his lap, you see a coal miner's lunch pail. They had to be very, very protective of the lunches. Anybody have an idea why? Rats. Rats, right. Colonies of rats, sometimes 200 to a colony, some as big as cats. Now, they did try to get a little friendly with these rats, occasionally bringing scraps of food from spread to feed them. Only because they felt the rats had a very keen sense of hearing and smell. If they could smell gas or these props starting to crack. They've seen a large pack of rats quickly running for fresh air, say to slow for another exit. You better believe the miners were right behind them, figured there's going to be an explosion or cave in, so they did. Catered to the rats.
Not that there is a shortage of this coal by any means in these hills. They could probably mine it for the next hundred years. But right now, there's very, very little demand for it.
Careful of your heads when you get out. 